Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the webinar on productive end use of mini grid using micro slash mini hydro um, hydropower. To start off with, I want to give you a brief uh, introduction to the organizers, about the organizers. This webinar is a collaborative effort between Energypedia, a knowledge platform for collaborative knowledge exchange on renewable energy, energy efficiency and energy access. The second partner is Hydro Empowerment Network, which is again an advocacy platform for micro slash mini hydropower practitioners in South and Southeast Asia. And the last is SCART Foundation, which was established by SCART Consulting in 2002 to foster the exchange of knowledge and experience in development cooperation. This webinar has also been funded by the SCART Foundation and as you can see, this webinar is a collaborative effort of three knowledge networks. Um, this is the last webinar in our series of three webinars. We had uh, initially conducted two webinars, the first on why mini grid technology need to be differentiated, the second on what <clears throat> about grid interconnection of mini grids and this as I mentioned is the last webinar but we are planning for a second season in the autumn and we are looking for sponsors for all for our last two webinars we have got amazing responses for each webinars we had more than 100 participants so this is a shout out to all the sponsors who are listening to us right now should you be interested we would be happy to our um, uh, collaborate with you and organize the next series of webinar on the following topics. These topics were suggested to us by our users during the survey or should you have your own topic we'd be happy to collaborate with you on those topics. Now I would like to pass on this microphone to Heidi who is my co-moderator and will further explain you about the uh, webinar today and so on. Thank you, Ranisha. Hello, everybody. My name is Hedi Feibel, working for SCART, as Ranisha already introduced myself. Um, maybe I just go through the um, topics in brief that we already have on the agenda for the next uh, series. Uh, that might, might be also about uh, productive use in Afghanistan and Pakistan, because South Asia's uh, largest mini-grid program so far was al always a bit overlooked. Um, and then why and how to map the mini grid potential, in particular for hydro and biomass, which means a kind of a resource assessment, how that is done, what kind of tools exist. Uh, another topic could be uh, scaling up of mini grids and what, what role are the local entrepreneurs playing. Uh, we will talk to one of these entrepreneurs today. Uh, why and how to integrate existing initiatives and know-how. There's an excellent example in Myanmar where Dipti will later on talk about. And we also thought maybe to talk about uh, mini grids within rural electrification programs, what should not be done and what should be done. So what are the lessons learned and what are the mistakes to be avoided. Uh, then a very important topic is uh, finance options. And finally, maybe look into the life, the daily life of a mini grid community organizers, just as an idea what might come up in the autumn series. Um, as Ranisha said, we had these two uh, webinars on mini-grid technologies to differentiate between the different technologies and in grid interconnection. And for both, you can find the recordings on the web. Today, we talk about productive use of mini-grids using micro and mini-hydro. So we will see three examples of how to make it happen. What you get in these presentations, we have three case studies. Um, we will travel all through Asia, so we start in Indonesia with a very small system of uh, 7.5 kilowatt, then go to Nepal and finally to Myanmar. Uh, so I'm welcoming also our presenters uh, in these different countries. I'm happy that they already joined us this morning. And they will present you the general features and the type of uh, productive end use that have been developed in the various projects, how these developed, how they were financed, uh, how they are operated and uh, who owns the productive use, what are the operational hours, 
they will explain you about the tariff and metering system and how these productive uses change the load factor. So how that uh, generated additional revenues for the hydropower scheme and increase its profitability. They will also talk a bit about the technical preconditions, so what are the challenges that they had to encounter. And finally, every one of them will give lessons learned. So as I said, we will start in Indonesia. So Amalia Suyana is going to present the first case for about 15 minutes, then we have a 10 minutes question answer session, uh, then again 15 minutes presentation uh, of the Myanmar case, 10 minutes question answer and then again the presentation of Nepal. Then after the third presentation I will uh, quickly summarize the key conclusions from all three cases and then you again have the uh, possibility to um, raise a few questions and you should uh, ask the questions in the question box in the uh, webinar tool. So um, if you have a look at it then you see where you can type in. Um, finally I will uh, give you a, a short overview on knowledge products related to the topic and uh, Ranisha will finally close our webinar. So our first presenter is Amalia Soyana. She has been working in, in, in the energy sector already since 2006. She started her career as an analyst of fuel price and subsidy in the Indonesian Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources. In 2010, she shifted to the Clinton Foundation, working on energy efficiency with the Jakarta city government. And in 2011, she joined GIZ as a renewable energy advisor, specifically dealing with rural electrification in Indonesia. Currently, she is the team leader of Energizing Development Indonesia, and she's an active member in the network of micro hydropower practitioners in South and Southeast Asia, the HPNet, uh, which we mentioned already several times. So, Amalia, um, I would now hand over to you. The floor is yours. Hello everyone, good morning and good afternoon for all of you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you all for having me here and this is such a good opportunity for me to share with you one of the examples um, on how we do, we promote productive and use using micro power in Indonesia. My name is Amalia Suryani, I'm working for GIZ at the moment for the Energizing Development Program. So, first of all, I would like to start with showing you this map. This map will show you there are around 200 micro hydropower have been constructed from various initiatives in Indonesia, be it government program or um, non-government association, uh, sorry, non-government organizations, community. So it's spread out from the west to the east. And what I would like to share is that although there are many micro hydropower, only a few of them actually um, use the electricity for the productive uses. So that is why, on in the year of 2012. And then Indonesia conducted a pilot project, PEU, pilot project, productive and use pilot project, in nine villages, as you can see in the screen at the moment. These nine villages are located in Sumatra and in Sulawesi Island. This is a lot of information, of course, and I would definitely love to um, share all of this, but of course, time is restricting. So I would choose one example from this pilot project that is the one village in Sulawesi called Salumukanan. So the highlight, the green highlight is the site that I would present more in this occasion. The Salumukanan, as I mentioned before, is located in Sulawesi, in West Sulawesi. The installed capacity is 7.5 kilowatt is a three-phase system. The number of households that was, um, as the customers, were 90 households, but at the moment it's already reduced, as, as the last time I heard the news that because the national grid already entered uh, the village. 
During our pilot, we supported six businesses, of which these six businesses using 18 electrical appliances to conduct their business. And the total investment in the construction was around 32,000 euros. And the community at that time also contributed uh, quite well in um, community level is quite significant, around 400, almost 500 euros by that time. The funder was a program on community empowerment. That is a World Bank funded program that is um, managed by the Ministry of Home Affairs in, the, in Indonesia. At the moment, both the micro hydropower and the businesses are owned by the community. And the MHP was operated since December 2010. How it started? So in 2012, in the um, mid-year, we invited several NGOs to cooperate with us, to work together, to prove that yeah, the, the, the main purpose of this pilot is to prove the assumption that productive use of energy may increase the sustainability of microhydropower. Much examples that yes, productive uses may increase the sustainability. So that's why we try in land villages and to see whether these assumptions were true. So the very first step that we did was we select the village using several criteria, as mentioned on the slide, that the MSP has to be operational, it has to have a um, good management team, and the village preferably already have running businesses with demand for electricity. It has social capital, which means the community is active and proactive in uh, promoting new initiative to support their micro hydropower. We also have accessibility criteria as one of our consideration because we want to we want to be able to regularly go and check what is happening and and to and to give support basically. So once we did the village selection, we continue with the preparation for the for the pilot. The preparation part we started with social socialization and coordination with the village um, committee. We also meet with the existing entrepreneurs that have a business already. When we say entrepreneurs, we're not talking about big and high capital businesses, but it's really small in the village and very limited market. We also did the procurement for appliances and we supported the installation of these appliances when it's necessary because um, later on in the uh, next slide, you would see that some of these appliances might need high load. So we need to make some adjustment in the current limiter, the MCBs, so that one business could, yeah, could use, could utilize their electrical appliances as necessary. And in the implementation phase, we continuously do facilitation technical assistance and monitoring as well as data collection and as and of course in the end we conclude with a reporting. Here I would like to emphasize that especially since I mentioned that there is this procurement of appliances, our very first idea actually not to provide the community with grants but during our socialization and lots of discussion with both our partners, our local partners and the community. Apparently, they don't have enough um, resources to, to procure the electrical appliances that they would need. 
So since we understood the difficulties, the challenges, then we decided to shift our first, very first plan to, to provide kind of loan to them and we shifted to provide grants instead. So we provide them with um, electrical appliances. Oh, sorry. We, when we, the overall pro pilot project was for six months, but the implementation itself, meaning that the business is running and then we collect the data was three months period. So we have data on how much, um, how much profit and how much work added after using the electrical appliances only for three, three months period. During the facilitation, we also promoted um, tariff system for the productive end use because we believe that this PEU should have, um, since the entrepreneurs have a benefit of using the electricity, then there should be an additional tariff for, for them. So then for the basic tariff for households, for around 1.2 to 1.6 euros per month. There are additional tariff for those entrepreneurs um, for around four euros per month for appliances for those businesses with low wattage um, appliances, such as the one that was used in bakery or bread maker and, and the tailor business. While for those businesses using higher um, wattage appliances, such as the blacksmith, the carpentry, the workshops, they use grinder, they use um, um, sander, planner, so all of those, they will have to pay an additional flat fee ranging from 2.4 to 4 euros per month for all equipment, so regardless how many appliances that they use for business. I would also like to present to you what kind of businesses, the six businesses that I mentioned before, they were quite, um, quite vary in, in terms of the kind of business ranging from uh, blacksmith, bakery, carpentry, cafe grinding, so like agro-processing, tailor and workshop. So you could see also in the third columns, the wattage of those electrical appliances that we provided for the, for the entrepreneurs and the type of appliances as well. Interestingly, or especially in Salomo Kanan, we, really, we were really happy with the results because in general, all these businesses reported profit. So that's one of the reasons also why I chose this, this site to, to present to you because we, uh, yeah, despite the very little uh, capacity of the micro hydropower, and if you see all this quite high wattage that they use for their business, this is actually one of the successful sites where, where they fulfill all the all the plans and ideas that we would like to, to show or to prove or to, to give example. One of the highlights of this site is that this village is that all these businesses are owned by a group of entrepreneurs, meaning that they are strong, either two, three, or even, yeah, through, I think two to four people in a group having this business. So we assume that be, um, by being in a group, they are stronger in running their businesses. The operational hours are, were increased from previously only 14 hours per day to 22 hours per day. With um, They make the organization in the morning until afternoon. The electricity will be used only for productive and used activities, while in the evening, starting at 4 p.m., it will be for household use. So, as I mentioned before, all the electrical appliances were provided through grants 
from NF. You could see also the price range of all the, the appliances. Smallest will be 18, oh sorry, yeah, 18 euros. And the most expensive one was the saw, circular saw, 180 euros. All these appliances are off the shelf, so you can find it very easy in the, in the shop in the town. Talking about the impact, I summarized into four main impacts. First, related to the road factor. We concluded that since they were more used during the day compared to previously, so the load factor is increased. Although, unfortunately, we couldn't measure it because um, in Salomo Kanan, there was no kilowatt hour meter installed. So this is a pity, but we believe that um, the use of electricity is much better since the yeah, business's productive use of electricity is, is, is in place. We also see that there is increase in the operational time, more or less eight hours during the day. This impact, we could see it as a plus and with, with, um, with the note that it means the operators will need longer time to work. So then there is also, in our note also, the operators will, they demand more um, salary, more honorarium for their extra hours of working. We also record that there was increase quite significantly in the electricity sales, of course, because they use more electricity, then the sales is more, meaning that the income for the management team for the microhydro power increased as well. And lastly, we're very happy to report that the majority of businesses, especially the one in Salomo Kanan, reported a profit. To give some examples of this, I would give four. First is the, is the carpentry business, where previously they used everything manually, and now since they use electrical appliances, then they can speed up their work. For instance, to make a cupboard, they normally take six days, and now with these tools, as you can see in the background of this um, photo, then they could finish the cupboard in only three days. And then the bread maker. In Solomon is one of the uh, successful examples where they can record in average 41 euros uh, profit per month during the three months uh, monitoring, which means increased 20% uh, compared to before the pilot. Another interesting example is the blacksmith business where usually they use a manual blower, as you can see in the, in the back, there is this bamboo. Usually there will be someone who blow this bamboo to have a good fire, but since they use the electrical blower, then they can, yeah, they can work faster and they can produce more um, tools, as I mentioned in the corner, left corner. And of course, in Sulawesi, there are, they are so famous with its cafe. And previously, the community only sells the cafe series, uh, series only for 6.6 uh, .6 euros per kilogram. So since they use the grinder, they can produce more, and the incremental benefit was around 1 euro per kilogram. This is really significant for, for them. The conclusion, I hope I still have time. Um, I like to divide it into two main items. First is the success factors and the shortcomings or barriers. There were increased profit in the businesses, increased load factor. We are very happy that in this village, in three villages actually, the EU tariff is applied. And we also learned that the group owned business performed well, performed better compared to the individually owned businesses. And we also see that what makes it successful if they use the off-the-shelf appliances compared to, compared to those villages who use specialized appliances, they are less successful because sometimes it just didn't work. And what was unsuccessful in the rest, um, in the remaining six villages, is 
uh, the villages were in Sumatra region, they couldn't apply the PEU tariff, so they couldn't show an incremental income for the MHP. We were also see that we were not very successful in promoting or introducing loan scheme for the procurement of princes so that we provided with the grant because yeah it's not ideal but during the pilot it's important to just show how important it is to have the productive and use it. And we see that we see the very specific challenges is that when we shift the livelihood of these people, the, usually they just do harvesting and they sell the products. And now we shift their habits into processing something. So this is really challenging for them. It's just if we try to look back on us, for us to change our job is also not very easy. And then if we reflect it to them also, for them it's not that um, they need to be to be uh, convinced that what we are introducing is actually good to increase their, their wealth. And we also see that uh, there is still, of course, limited or unknown market. Although they are successfully growing the coffee, there are still challenges for them to sell the, the branded coffee. So, and then the last one, I think, how can donors support PEU for what we learned before? Basically, the community are really thirsty of knowledge on how to develop businesses, and still they are very weak in the capital. So grants or ideally loans would be very helpful for them, yeah, to do more productive activities. So I would like to conclude or close my presentation with this statement that I quote from the 50 breakthrough report by IGTT that electricity will not by itself change lives. It is what people do with it that matters. Okay, thank you very much. And I would like to get back to Heidi. Thank you very much, Amalia. That was a very interesting presentation on what's going on in Indonesia. I think we got a very uh, illustrative example on what people are exactly doing with energy, how they benefit. There were a few questions coming up. I think a few I could quickly summarize. The question was, uh, maybe that was not fully understand. GIZ implemented in Indonesia a hydropower project and uh, subsidized through this World Bank fund uh, the implementation of the hydropower schemes and that was more or less finished. Uh, there was some awareness raising on productive use and uh, but there was no uh, significant support I would say and then sometime later uh, what I understood from Amalia um, this idea came up uh, to promote productive use in a sense of providing loans. So GIZ tried in a few villages to offer loans to buy appliances, but it seems that people were not ready to repay for appliances. Maybe they were a bit afraid of whether they can repay it or I think we have to see that these villages were quite remote and uh, business very slowly developed. Uh, so it was maybe not the ideal context really uh, to start as successful as we might see afterwards in uh, Myanmar and in Nepal. Uh, but um, the question for GIZ was to see first, is the MHP running well? That's why on one slide uh, Amalia showed the MHP itself should be operational first, uh, that mm -hmm. you see, okay, they are well maintaining and they're operating before we come in with new ideas about productive use and can they manage it? Uh, so GIZ wanted to make sure that they don't support a project which, which was not so successful in managing the hydropower scheme mm -hmm. by additional productive use. So mm -hmm. and then um, the hydropower scheme got uh, some subsidies but there was also village contribution and the productive use which was then introduced afterwards they got full subsidy from GIZ because you understood as an organization that it's difficult to introduce a loan scheme. Mm -hmm. um, is that correct, Amalia? Yeah, basically, yeah, <laughs> all your explanation was correct. I just want to emphasize maybe um, this is true that uh, my part of power in the case of Salomo Kanan village was funded by that um, 
the PIPM program, the World Bank, World Bank funded program, but GIZ in general supporting many initiatives. But this one, this one example was the one that was funded with, uh, by the PNPM. And this is true also that in the beginning of our support for this green PNPM, we were not um, strongly promote the PUE yet. We, we really want to, but we, there was the challenges for so much in the technical, uh, technical part. So that's where we put our emphasis so much on that, on that, on that part. Um, and then on the on 2012, we had the chance to to look further and then to be more creative in in promoting productive and use. So that's why we we were able to um, to, to to conduct the the pilot in 2012. And before this presentation, actually, I I managed to contact. Um, our our partners there, and they say the microhydro power is still operational, but they have less customers now, as I mentioned before, that because the national grid is coming already, but it's still operational. So it's, okay, yeah, we're I mean, th yeah. Thank you. That that was one question that also came up. Uh, what exactly is going to happen with the hydropower scheme at the moment? And mm -hmm. this is maybe a general question which will also come up for the Myanmar case. Uh, mm -hmm. What happens to these hydropower schemes once the grid arrives? Uh, will the scheme lose its best customers, the productive use to the national grid? Or what exactly is going to happen? Which somehow mm -hmm. makes the link to our preceding webinar on grid interconnection. But I would uh, leave it like that for the moment, for the time being, because we have uh, two more presentations. Uh, there are a few more questions coming up. Uh, Amalia could tell you that Uganda is also looking for GIZ uh, support in that sense of uh, promoting productive use. So maybe there's the next field of activity. Um, there are a few more questions which we, are go we will try to answer then in written after the webinar. Um, for example, also the question why the loan was unsuccessful, what exactly kind of effort was done and why it didn't work out. But uh, let's continue with the next um, presentation. Um, sorry for cutting you at that point, but thanks again to Amalia. Uh, thank you. So let's continue with Myanmar. Um, Dipti Wagela is going to present. Uh, she holds a Bachelor in Mechanical Engineering from the University of California, Berkeley, and a Master's in Environment uh, Studies from San Jose State, of University, State University. Uh, inspired by her family's roots in rural India, Dipti focuses on sustainability of decentralized rural renewable energy solutions. And since 2007, uh, sorry, 2006, her parallel roles as a researcher, as a practitioner, facilitator, she has helped uh, to synergize communities and local entrepreneurs, field-based NGOs and policy makers and funding agencies in implementing community-based en energy initiatives in South and Southeast Asia. In 2012, she co-founded uh, co the Hydro Empowerment Network, HPNet, a knowledge exchange platform for local practitioners. In 2014 and 2015, she assisted the Renewable Energy Association of Myanmar to conduct a practice to policy exchange, uh, or several exchanges, sorry, that promote uh, renewable energy mini grids in Myanmar. Since last year, Dipti is a Fulbright uh, Clinton Public Policy Fellow placed in Myanmar to support mini grids integration in the national electrification plan. And I would like to add that Dipti is really the huge facilitator um, for the Hydro Empowerment Network and I'm really happy that today she is going to present herself about the experience in the region. Uh, she did so much uh, to bring people together, to exchange experience and really to facilitate knowledge exchange in the whole region. Thank you Dipti and I'm looking forward for your presentation. Thank you, Hedi. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. I appreciate being able to give a glimpse of, uh, of what's on the ground in Myanmar. As Hedi mentioned, I'm a Fulbright Fellow placed at the Renewable Energy Association of Myanmar, also known as REAM. 
And REAM is, is one of those special organizations that can really uh, work with a diverse set of stakeholders uh, to, to bring meaningful change. Today I will be giving you a glimpse of a subset of mini-grids in Myanmar that have been self-financed and self-implemented. And at the crux of, of the success of these mini-grids has been productive end use. So let me start by giving you a very brief policy situation overview. Uh, the central grid in Myanmar reaches a little over 30% of the population. And recently, the World Bank provided a $400 million loan to Myanmar to electrify all of its population. This is known as the National Electrification Plan, or the NEP. The gaps that we work on um, one is to, uh, well, for the any place, uh, a, a study was to analyze what is the cost way to electrify all of Myanmar. And, and the study that over 99% of the population would require the national grid. However, this study didn't include the mini grids, um, uh, the renewable energy mini grids that have actually long been in Myanmar. And, and so the, the analysis is um, incomplete, and we, we want to uh, understand what are uh, low-cost, sustainable ways to integrate mini-grids into national planning. And the second gap that we, we actually um, are quite uh, walking an uphill <laughs> slope is that, that the business-as-usual approaches we see are really being pushed in Myanmar. Um, Mini grids are sandwiched between solar home lighting systems, which are meant to serve as pre-electrification methodology, and and then on the other hand, um, large-scale fossil fuel-based infrastructure, uh, which is not good for Myanmar's uh, development or or peace process, are are also being pushed. Whereas renewable energy mini grids or decentralized renewable en energy, even at a larger scale, is a much more um, sustainable and, and equitable approach to the country. This graph uh, will give you an idea of, of some of the numbers. Uh, we actually at REAM think these numbers are on the conservative side, but nonetheless, uh, they help to quantify. And what I will be using, or where I get the 3,500 plus mini grids on the ground, I, is a combination of the micro mini hydro mini grids and the biomass gasifier. The solar number is, is a combination of solar mini-grids and solar home lighting, and, and there are many, many diesel generators. In fact, uh, the last few days I spent uh, time on the ground with Reem's sub-offices where we visited villages that had all three of these technologies on the ground in one village, um, and, and a number of villages. There's, in fact, a phrase in Burmese language, kotu kota minale, which means self-electrification, to electrify one's own community uh, without the need for government. And, um, and so essentially mini-grids are, are really a low-hanging fruit if we want to meet the 2030 goal of electrifying all of Myanmar's population. So in that sense, um, I really see Myanmar's progress with mini-grids as a success. Um, and a success that international development practitioners like myself and, and all of us can, can learn from. We all know that international development uh, aid programs are, are designed in ways uh, that aim for self-replication replica and scalability after the resources to the program have concluded. And so in that sense, the 3,500 plus mini-grids on the ground in Myanmar were implemented with no technical, uh, no technology transfer or training, no international funding, there was no scaled government program or policy, and yet the number of mini-grids that exist on the ground far surpass um, what any funded program that I know of in South and Southeast Asia has been able to achieve. And so this, again, is, is a really a unique opportunity for all of us to learn how this happened in Myanmar. Uh, and, and in addition to wanting to contribute and bring our own solutions, 
it's very important at this stage to, to take a step back and, and learn from the sector. And this is where um, we, if we take a very close look, we can see that uh, there have been a set of social entrepreneurs, very talented, bright engineers who, who really take pleasure in developing their own technology solutions and providing the community with 24-7 reliable electricity. So here we have U Uso Tin Ong, who is a biomass gasifier developer, showing one of his four designs for gasification technologies. His vision is to upgrade all of the gasifiers in Myanmar so that they don't, they no longer pollute the water. This is U Tan Te, who recently has embarked on solar PV with drip irrigation, and at the bottom, all of these are mini and micro hydropower developers. Uh, we have identified a small group of these, but we actually believe there are at least 50 developers in Myanmar. We have been in touch with um, eight of them, and, and these include uh, developers who are third generation. This is uh, U Kun Jo, who's in, in his 80s now, and, and when I visit him, sometimes he's, he's in the hospital, but we, we don't talk about his health, we talk about microhydro. He's constantly thinking of how to improve his projects on the ground. Uh, Ko Zhao Min is, is uh, building the third generation of hydropower developers, and today we will focus on Usain Tun La's work. Uh, he and his brothers have implemented over 200 micro mini hydro projects, and one of uh, the approaches he uses is, is quite fascinating, and this is the project that I will focus on today. So the project is called the Nongpeng Project, located in northern Shan State. Uh, the output capacity is 200 kilowatts. It was constructed over a th three-year period, but it was done in phases, as often um, Sai Tun La and brothers uh, do. They, they, um, because they are self-financing these projects, they want to start to electrify households as soon as possible. So electricity was uh, generated using a smaller system, a smaller mini micro hydropower system starting in 2010. And uh, there are 550 consumers uh, covering uh, 14 villages. And you can see the other uh, engineering specifications here. And this year, the national grid arrived to the Nanking project. Here are some pictures as um, Amalia and many others uh, can tell you that um, implementing micro hydropower is, um, is uh, it's very multifaceted. To get the equipment to these remote areas, to uh, get them uphill uh, to where the, the source of the water is, I mean, it's, it really requires everyone in the community to take part. Uh, it requires local innovation. But in the end, you have, um, you have a solution that requires very little operation and maintenance. It's low cost. There are no batteries to replace. The one thing that does need to be maintained is the watershed. And, and the best projects are done with uh, watershed protection. This is a map of, of the Nangping transmission and distribution network. And this is one of the users uh, actually now uh, switching between the national grid and the micro mini hydro unit. Let's take a look at the ownership and financing in this project. The total cost um, was uh, nearly four hundred and thirty thousand um, dollars, and this, uh, as if you look back at our first webinar series, you will see this is on the the, the average to lower end of how um, uh, how much micro hydro projects cost per kilowatt. The, the financing was done uh, through, firstly, the developer formed, Usain Tunla formed a cooperative of uh, shareholders, uh, each of them uh, paying an equal share, which formed 30% of the financing. And then with the connection costs from, the, from each household, uh, the remaining uh, cost of the project was obtained, and then there was also about 20% of the project 
uh, required a short-term loan from a local uh, cooperative. And, uh, and so this, this cooperative is officially registered and uh, before the grid arrived it was making uh, between uh, 5500 to $7,500 uh, based on how, what exchange rate you use and, and the years that went by between it, uh, the, the commissioning date and 2016. And after the grid arrived, uh, it's been much less. And, and this is why REAM and HPNet are, we are working hard to, to see how we can uh, grid interconnect this project as, as Myanmar's first interconnected project. The fees and tariffs, uh, Usain Tunla and uh, the cooperative firstly analyzed the demand and willingness to pay. Uh, they have customized the tariffs and connection fees to match each household's strength. So, and in this case, they actually correlated to how far they were from the, from the, the road and also from the power plant. Uh, but, but yeah, you can see that among the 14 villages, there's variation um, of, of the different connection fees and uh, the tariff levels range also based on whether it's a residential user or commercial use which uh, we refer to as productive end use and and in this project everyone first uh, acquires a single phase meter and then if they would like to use this for uh, three phase or uh, any productive end use that requires this there's no additional uh, connection charge for this and there's also temporary connections for those who might be seasonal uh, doing seasonal businesses or waiting for the national grid to arrive uh, there was a different tariff level for that and there is this uh, note that I make uh, to show where the national grid how a tariff compares and um, yeah I, I, we will share more details on this later when I visited this project last month, uh, having been a microhydro practitioner myself, uh, one of the most impressive aspects was the management uh, team, uh, which has been in place since its start. Uh, they have a staff of seven. Um, their salaries total work out to a little over $800 a month, and they take meticulous notes. Um, each household has a meter. And um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a proper utility. They have an office where users come to pay their bills. And they have they had very little uh, management issues. There are some users who pay late. But besides that, um, there hasn't been major issues. And this is partly because the system uh, right now is uh, the capacity and the demand are sized uh, to a balance. But if if more people were to use the system, I think that there would be peak load issues. Uh, but one thing that definitely seems to help them is to have meters where users can see the voltage fluctuation. So um, especially users that have higher loads um, can see that, ah, OK, we are going into peak load times. And this means that I need to adjust my load so that we're not overloading the entire system. The productive end use in the village is what Usain Tula designed this project around. So, you know, as microwriter practitioners, we look for for sites that have head and flow. In Usain Tula's case, he looks for projects that have um, that that have productive end use. So he's looking at, in this case, he was able to assess potential productive end use. I know that in his current projects, he really looks at existing end use and and for him I mean this really is the first criteria before he decides whether to implement a microhydro system so here we had uh, corn milling and drying before uh, the microhydro system arrived which was powered on diesel and shifted to the hydro project and then afterwards I mean there have been a number of different um, uh, productive end uses uh, there are 12 uh, 
wells that have a, that are connected to air compressors. The air is pumped down the well, and uh, water comes out, and the water is sold to villages that are above uh, this level. And so, yeah, it's a, somewhat of a of a micro water utility. There's concrete brick making. Uh, you can see Usantula here with some of the shareholders. And there's uh, many restaurants. Uh, here's a kitchen uh, using rice cookers. And um, there are two petrol pump stations. And very recently, uh, a, a company in Mandalay, of Myanmar's big city, uh, has given by installment basis an 18 kilowatt peanut oil press machine to one of the users there. And so uh, yeah, this is the most recent productive end use. There are different factors that um, that go into understanding the potential for productive end use, and and these uh, factors listed here are not just specific to this project, but they come from an interview with uh, with a number of the developers. One is the family's uh, innate income and skill sets. If they tend to be near the main road, or if they have family members working abroad. Um, or have greater number of agriculture assets, they usually have um, ingrained skill sets to be a, a local entrepreneur. And then there are also cooperatives uh, that, that uh, help communities or factions of the community save money. And these are also because they are able to, uh, they have balance sheets and able to understand money and savings, they, they also tend to be good entrepreneurs. And then there's also the developer's role. Uh, as I mentioned, identifying uh, potential mini-grid sites uh, with productive end use, but also um, at least for developers in Myanmar who have their own fabrication workshops, they can, they can actually build productive end use machinery in these workshops. Um, because this is actually a challenge across our HPNet countries, is finding small-scale appliances that work with with uh, the output of mini grids, and and finally, um, yeah, I think that the larger private sector can play a role in in customizing for pr productive end use that match mini grids. After the main grid arrived in Nong Peng, what what changed? Well, uh, because the main grid's reliability is still not up to par. Uh, we were there in the afternoon and the voltage had dropped considerably and it continues to drop through the evening hours. So this has meant that, um, that some residential customers have started to use the grid during off-peak hours, but the productive end-use loads uh, still rely only on the mini hydropower. And this might also be uh, due to the fact that many of the shareholders have productive end-use. Um, and, and the utility hasn't changed, the mini hydro utility hasn't changed its tariff or connection fees. I mean, as you see, uh, I mean, they're, they're barely surviving at, at this rate. And, and to reduce it more, I, I think, would, would put them into the negative. So what are the key lessons from this project? Well, one is that to sustain the mini grid, productive end use is absolutely required. Um, uh, and in this case, as in many cases, the productive end use is done by local entrepreneurs. So there is a social, socioeconomic benefit of providing services to households, but also village level entrepreneurs creating this local economy of, uh, of projects. I'm sorry, I think my computer has frozen. <laughs> not able to, uh, oh, okay, here we go. Um, yeah, so our greatest challenge uh, for productive end use has been that the very marginalized communities that are much more remote than others do not have entrepreneurial skill sets. Uh, they need financing to, um, to even implement the mini grid project. And in the case of Myanmar, the, the national electrification plan, uh, the mini grid program within this plan actually mandates each project to have productive end use. But to date, 
none of the NEP partners have offered support to make this happen. Uh, it is not something that will happen on its own. Um, in the case of Nongpeng, it, it was the developer who pushed this. Um, but we really would love to see something that, uh, that Amalia just uh, mentioned in Indonesia to happen in Myanmar. And, um, and so there is actually um, the Japanese agency JICA that has um, been offering a loan for SMEs in Myanmar and it's been quite successful and we're wondering how we could link this uh, to productive end use of mini grids. Okay, I think my <laughs> computer is um, uh, sticking here, but there are a number of people that I would uh, like to acknowledge and um, uh, and I would like to share that, um, that this project will be featured in a case study uh, soon to be released um, in the in coming weeks by Reem and also by Windrock International. Um, both uh, all of us visited Nong Peng last month, and it was it was really thanks to Windrock International Bikash Pandey that helped us to understand uh, the project in its in its whole. So stay tuned for the case study. Thank you. Here we go. Yeah, thank you very much, Dipti, for this excellent presentation. I think uh, the audience was extremely impressed uh, by the nice case of Myanmar. Uh, I would say there were two short questions. One was uh, electricity in the main grid. What is the main source? Uh, as far as I know, it's big hydro and diesel. And the second question um, was about is there a kind of a database? Uh, you mentioned this lessons learned. I mean, Myanmar is an excellent case to learn from, but how to learn from? You mentioned there will be a case study on that, but is there in addition any kind of a database um, where people get more information on um, Myanmar? Actually, um, this is something that's on my work plan for the fellowship is to develop an online portal. There, there, are, um, there are a number of groups producing uh, also great um, insights from the ground um, and, um, and the NEP itself, uh, but we really need to, to come together and, and have, um, have this. Uh, HPNet has has an existing online library which um, I can uh, I can <laughs> um, take the initiative to upload all of all of Myanmar articles into one chapter there, but uh, but in general the answer is no. It is quite difficult to find um, uh, the latest and comprehensive data on Myanmar at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will also give you uh, several links at the, at the end of the webinar where you can find information and Dipti could then upload further information that she has from Myanmar, at least the few that is available. Um, because there's also the question about these presentations which we have today for sure, we will also make them all available and you can even watch the recordings afterwards. Um, with this I would like um, to continue with our next presentation. Unfortunately, we are a little bit behind time, but I think we can still handle it. Can you see my screen? Okay. So the next presentation will be uh, shown by Birba Durgale from Nepal. He has more than 25 years of experience in the micro and mini hydropower sector. In 1995, he founded his own company, Hydro Energy Concern Private Limited. He has been awarded the Ashoka Fellowship for having excelled in social entrepreneurship. And after his first mini hydro project in Barpak, the one he is going to present today of 130 kilowatt, he started promoting awareness and social benefits of hydropower systems a bit more in general. So far, his contribution has helped to electrify more than 4,000 households. And Bia Bahadurji is uh, convinced that the economic and social development, as well as the low environmental impact related to mini and micro hydropower, represents the three inseparable pillars of sustainable development of Nepal. So I hand over to Bia Bahadur Gale. Thank you very much. And uh, 
Let's listen to the Nepal case. Hello? Hello? Hello, Hello. Yes, yes Hello. we can see your presentation. Please go ahead with the presentation. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I'm Bill Badr from Nepal. Uh, I'm the owner of Barbara Electrification Private Limited, and as well as uh, I'm Hydro Energy Concern Private Limited, uh, is the base of Micro Hydro Projects Consultant Company, as uh, as well uh, installer company. And we have installed uh, about 43, 43, 45 micro hydro power pro projects in the different part of the country, uh, and about 23,000 households are electrified. And this is a background. Uh, background of uh, the huge potentials. Uh, hydro electricity is the huge potential country, and about nearly 40,000 megawatt uh, potential in the country and uh, uh, use 700 megawatt and and 40, 54 megawatt of this suitable for below one megawatt projects. Uh, and extension of the national grid expensive, time consuming and difficult because the uh, rural area of Nepal is very settlement is very scattered and micro and mini hydro projects are very appropriate for the mountain and rural area. Simple and inexpensive uh, technology with the locally manageable resources. And uh, in a addition to these solar resources, uh, the annual average insulation type, uh, insulations, five kilowatt uh, hour meter square a day, and high wind energy also potential in high Himalayan plateaus, and biogas also highly feasible uh, below 1,000 meter altitude. And uh, in my initiation in micro hydro power projects, I'm sorry, uh, the, but this is the background of the uh, solid feature of micro uh, electrification. And we installed 1991 in 50 kilowatt projects. It's the first micro hydro project around there. Around there. And uh, the design flow was 100 liter per second and gross hit uh, 96 liter. And uh, connected household are 564, and transmission lines to 6.4 kilometer LT line and uh, SD line 1.8 kilometer. The total project cost was uh, 58,000, uh, about 58,000 US dollar, and uh, the subsidy we got from uh, Nepal government 20%, uh, uh, and the loan 60% from the Agriculture Development Bank, and equity 20%. From uh, myself. So, and then next one, uh, the second one, we extended the micro hydropower project in 2004 uh, to the, uh, we installed uh, to the local dem uh, energy demand fulfill, uh, local energy demand, and plant capacity, design capacity was only 95 kilowatt, but, uh, but now it uh, can generate uh, 130 kilowatt to 136 kilowatt. Design flow 90 liter per second and growth at 193 meter. And we use the pelletin turbine, single jet pelletin turbine, and number of connection household are uh, 1,186 household. And transmission line 12 kilometer uh, single uh, three phase uh, LT line and 2.8 kilometer SD line 11 kV. The total project cost was 1,058,000, uh, 158,000. Uh, US dollar, including all the structure of uh, the 50 kilowatt projects. Uh, AEPC, we got a second project, we got a, a uh, subsidy from AEPC around 48% and loan 40% from our relatives, my valuation, and uh, equity 12% by um, Barbara Rural Electrification Private Limited. Uh, in my initiation in micro hydropower projects, in 1989, the government has announced uh, uh, the first subsidy subsidized for the alternative energy, uh, energy sources for dynamo water mill. And uh, I, uh, when I was, I started uh, my involvement in micro hydropower project, 
uh, I started at a very early age uh, when I was 20 years old. And yes, and this uh, the first power project, um, uh, micro hydro power project, 50 kilo micro hydro power project, during the 1991 to 2000, uh, 2004, the tariff was a system for water 0.012. To 0 0.18 US dollar per month, and lighting load was um, morning only two to three hours, evening four to six hours. The generated power at the daytime used for the one day agro processing mill it has consumed 5.5 kilowatt. The monthly revenue at that time uh, for the from the domestic light 270 US dollar, but uh, but one micro hydro but 350 US dollar. Uh, from agro processing mill. The economic, uh, the, my project economic status was so weak. The maximum load factor uh, at that time about the 20 to 25 percent. And uh, after that, we learned the lesson from this uh, tariff system. And we flat tariff system, we realized that flat tariff system to be changed. The tariff system needed with the payment for lower hour. The uh, economic status of the micro hydro projects can be improved with the productive uses. Already, uh, because we uh, realized already 27% of the revenue from only 5.5 uh, kilowatt mill was needed for more productive use. And we started identification and assessment of the various cottage industries, uh, meaning existing indigenous business to be mod uh, modernized to use the electric appliances, uh, appliances um, like a carpentry workshop, blacksmith, and Nepali handmade paper. And after that, uh, this kind of uh, different type of uh, industries set up in part of. And, uh, Two uh, agro processing mill uh, set up. Uh, the operating time was uh, 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. and currently works up. Uh, also set up in only 9 a.m. to 5 uh, operating time 5 p.m. and bakery open is just for the post night uh, uh, and it has consumed 6 kilowatt and Nepali handmade paper. Uh, uh, the energy used for raw material cooking, uh, the, it also for the uh, energy used for uh, in the operating time post night, and metal workshop also set up 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. the operating time, and video parlor 9 uh, uh, late night for on ropeway. Uh, I think it's the uh, is the first micro hydro driven goods transport ropeway. It, the use of power only uh, 10 kilowatt and operating time 6 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And uh, this, these are the uh, uh, productive images uh, Nepali handmade paper, carpentry, and goods transport ropeway. And uh, uh, after, in, uh, we, but now in 100. 30 kilowatt projects, the tariff system is quite different, and we have uh, we classify for the different uh, uh, for different purpose and domestic uh, we supply them for our energy and up to 25 unit uh, unit is up to 1.5 US dollar per month and the above the rate 0 0.7 uh, 0 0.7 uh, uh, kilowatt hour. And commercial uh, commercial industries, commercial industries means a dedicated line. Uh, we supply three phase up to 25 kVA, and uh, minimum rate. Uh, sorry, uh, demand charge. Uh, demand charge is eight. Sorry, eight. Uh, eight eight dollar. Mm, sorry, yeah, eight dollar uh, for kVA, and uh, the, above the rate minimum one point uh, one to uh, 0 0.12 uh, dollar per, um, per unit, and we supply 24 hour. And a daytime cottage industry is a three phase line, uh, up to 10 kilowatt, and uh, 
for only 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. and 0 0.8 per unit to 0 0.1 uh, above the 30, uh, 30, uh, 30 unit. And of our cottage industries, she pays up to 20 kilowatt and uh, is a very cheaper price, uh, 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. Uh, line for industries which require 24 hour service are called dedicated line. The type of supply is C in a kilovolt ampere as the transformer are used to supply 11 kb to them. And uh, we have set up the very cheaper price uh, is of our um, rate mm, uh, than the peak out rate to encourage the uh, our energy cost to uh, small business activities. And uh, this type of eco processing are running in a uh, in my project. Uh, uh, eco processing type number of eco processing mill are there, and it consumes 20 kilowatt and uh, wall expeller two uh, wall expeller are there, uh, 12 kilowatt high vision hull, uh, but not the operating one of the high vision because uh, badly damaged by earthquake and uh, cyber cafe uh, also. Operating photo studio and metal workshop. Uh, metal or two metal workshop are there, and 12 it consumes 12 kilowatt. And stone cutting mill, uh, three uh, different um, sizes cut, cutting stone uh, stone cutting mill are there. And bakery open. It has use uh, energy use only post night and uh, for 12 kilowatt. The mobile three mobile tower are there. And it has consuming 12 to 20 kilowatt for mobile tower. And there's one, uh, one up there, furniture, box, uh, carpentry works up to are there. And cable, cable, television also is not op operating. Uh, and electronic repairing center. Uh, this and three uh, computer, mobile, and uh, photocopy, like that kind of uh, electronic goods repairing center. And total uh, energy uh, for the um, productive energies, it has consuming 105 kilowatt. These are the uh, stone cutting mill and metal workshop picture, and uh, internet, wireless internet system, and telephone uh, mobile tower of this photo. And this is the bakery oven. And, 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 items are here and uh, this kind of control also and currently uh, and the total revenue of uh, those eggs uh, the around 51 percent revenue come from the domestic flight I think and um, 22 22 percent dedicated lines uh, and 2 percent uh, of our industries and 25% uh, at the daytime industries low uh, you know. uh, um, and present energy scenario in the place uh, today about uh, 400 households are uh, using the cooking and uh, other household activities and in 2015 April earthquake uh, the every center is in Park and now increasing the energy demand due to the reconstruction and development activities. Um, most of people are using the uh, construction tools. Uh, and uh, now additional, we need the 500 kilowatt required to fulfill energy demand is uh, increasing by 2000, 10 to 12% per year. Uh, head at this site can be increased, but additional fuel available, but not enough for the 500 kilowatt. The regulation of the tariffs, uh, energy tariff needed to better balance load between the peak and of our uh, of peak hour. The summary on how uh, PU was developed in the project: uh, the mill established to meet the local demand, uh, essential for the population, and the awareness raising on the PU promote the skill local and introduce new technology plus access to finance for the entrepreneur to buy advances, loans, unlike for the development bank and local microfinance institution. The modernization of the existing local inquiry we use for our other form of the energy. The introduced fair and trans transparent tariff system. 
utilize excess energy during make, uh, minimum load hour by the introducing dynamic tariff system with a seasonal tariff managed by the smart meter. Uh, from one to two, the generate more revenue for the micro hydro and more employment in the village. The expand micro hydro power projects capacity as the consum uh, consumption grow or even better design the MSP for the every beginning also for our developing view. Conclusion. The uh, micro hydro power project can not only meet lighting requirement but also substantially improve the livelihood of the rural community. Study possibility of the view already doing feasibility to ensure the correct design, employment and income generation, information and communication through enterprise development, it is of the interlinked area micro hydro power can support. The future focus on the soft loan facility and facilitation of the small and medium enterprise development both to maximize load factor of the micro hydro power project. The private sector need to invest in development initiative while government maintain strength assessment and regulation for fast and easy access to subsidy. Loan and subsidy for the micro hydro as well as for few should be accessible to the private, cooperative and other investor invest, uh, interested stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bir. Uh, I have to I have to apologize really uh, to the audience uh, that the sound quality was so bad. Uh, actually, we tested with all three presenters in advance, but you never know how the line is developing over time. So. I'm very sorry for that. Uh, I think we still can read through the slides and get the information uh, that you presented. Uh, I think it was also a very interesting uh, case study um, of also a private developer who took the initiative and who pushed things, who uh, was uh, involved in awareness raising and invested own money, you took the risk. So there's really uh, for us a unique chance to hear, to speak to you as a person uh, who was uh, really involved. Um, there were very few questions coming up. Uh, one was about, could you say what is the load factor of the plant at the moment? Now, uh, uh, load factor, our load factor around 40, 47 to 50 uh, percent mm -hmm. of my project. That's quite good, yeah. So yeah, 47 man. up to 50 yes. percent. Um, another question was how you restrict the access at certain hours. I understood you use smart meters, is that correct? Hello, Biaji. Yeah, yeah. Man. Uh, is there smart meters installed yes. in the household? No, no. Uh, we installed just a meter, a mm -hmm. energy meter, not a smart meter. Okay. But how do you restrict the hours then? What? What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, the question is, how do people know from this time until this time uh, I can use electricity and then I have to stop my appliance? How do people know that? Uh -huh. Is there any switch? Uh, we, but uh, uh, we supply 20, dedicated, sorry, dedicated line we supply 24 hours and uh, uh, the domestic light also 24 hours. And day hour, uh, we supply only uh, industrial area, uh, industrial uh, for the cottage industries. And uh, we pick the meter and uh, we. Okay, so I understand dedicated. Yeah. Yeah. Dedicated line with, uh, we supply 24 hours. 
and domestic also we supply 24 hour but our rule all uh, day out load uh, they cut, sorry but they yeah. cut it we supply only day day time uh, sorry so I understand there are dedicated lines for industrial purpose for uh, small industries that get uh, 24 hours electricity and households as well but they know about the times when they can use and when they should switch off the appliances yes 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 ma'am exactly okay okay I think we are a bit late so I would uh, like to proceed just to um, give a short summary on what we learned today. I think Nepal was again a very interesting example. Um, I would like to add to these three presentations an, an aspect which was not highlighted because we didn't have a suitable case study. That's the direct drive of agro-processing machines. If you look at this picture, this uh, red device is the turbine and on the very left hand side you see the generator. So uh, what you can do in a small hydropower system or in a mini hydropower system uh, you can drive the generator and produce electricity or you take off this belt and you put the belt on this thresher for example or on the huller which you see in the background you put the belt on one of the machines and you simply uh, make a direct drive on that machine that means in the same time you can't use electricity so there is a break in electricity supply but you can use a uh, direct drive which has uh, much higher efficiency so you have less energy loss and it's possible without a load control so very simple small systems which don't have uh, electric load control uh, could operate also in this way by driving machines directly the shortcoming is that you have to install this machinery in the powerhouse because you have to be close to the shaft because the shaft is driving um, anything the generator and the different machines so this is just to add uh, direct drive options um, that is also a way to uh, um, promote productive use. So to summarize in brief, uh, one point that we learned is it's important to consider productive end use from the very beginning. So beginning. The productive end use is a key element for livelihood improvement through energy access and as we saw in the different cases there are two possibilities. One is to modernize existing activities so like this blacksmith who used the blowing device before and now he has something uh, which works on electricity but the business existed before but there's also the way to develop new uh, activities but these new ones often require some awareness raising or something which I would call participatory assistance so people need to understand what to do with electricity um, then productive use has to be considered already during the planning phase to, avo to avoid that businesses are prevented from growing. Uh, if you install load lim limiters then rather for the household and make more energy available uh, for the productive use. You need an appropriate metering and tariff scheme that was really the case in all the examples that we heard today uh, so that finally you can increase and maximize the revenues and improve profitability and thus also the sustainability of the hydropower scheme. Then how to finance the productive use of energy? There is really access needed to attractive credit schemes or to subsidies like in the case of uh, GIZ in Indonesia so that people can purchase machines uh, and that uh, this should be available to privates as well as community organizations. Uh, in Myanmar we saw that this is somehow a combination of investment by privates and the community. There is a cooperative and uh, so it should not be restricted to the private sector. There's in many cases there are also community organizations which are well organized which could also have productive use um, which they follow up. Um, there should be some incentive for local private developers to also contri contribute their equity. I mean, like we learned from Birgi in the last case, uh, for him it's an intrinsic interest uh, to have this productive use to get his invested money back. The more electricity that he can sell, uh, the better is the profitability of his hydropower scheme. So he would do anything to really sustain this productive use. Uh, it has to be considered what happens when the national grid arrives. I mean, we saw that in the case of Indonesia, we saw that in the case of Myanmar, 
uh, and even in the case of Nepal sooner or later this problem comes up and if somebody in particular if it's a private investor uh, he needs to be prepared uh, can he sell his surplus electricity will he lose customers to the national grid this is a point that really has to be seen in parallel so we had one um, webinar on grid interconnection we have one on productive use and we see there are many linkages between the two um, there is promotion and targeted support required that means uh, you need to get developers input to design the soft skills aspects of productive use they know best uh, the economy of the area they know what to do in order to promote a business even their own business but they also need resources to help uh, them to um, to develop uh, productive use like the case of Myanmar or Dipti said their productive use is mandatory for the proposals in the national program, but there is no support provided, neither as a subsidy nor as a loan. So it, in, in many cases, I mean, except maybe Nepal, they did it, oh no, they also had the APC uh, support, they also had the subsidy. So there's always a little bit of support required, at least the access to any uh, finance uh, schemes on site. Um, then the final conclusion I would say is that we really need a conceptual change of uh, this topic. Productive use is often neglected because it's neither the natural element of energy projects nor of a business development project. So it's not part of any of these but somehow it's needed for both of them. And so far uh, we only saw a few donors uh, and organizations like GSZ in this energizing development project in Nepal and practical action in Nepal who provide the financial and technical assistance. And we would like to create much more awareness also with this webinar, uh, what is the benefit of productive use and how urgently it's really needed. So uh, a last point I would say are the good lessons learned from Myanmar from this self-replication of mini-grids. I think there's still a lot to be discovered and we are looking forward to the results of Dipti's work in Myanmar. So these were my final conclusions and at the end I would like to show you this list of uh, relevant uh, knowledge products. Um, there are mainly four of them. We have the productive end use portal of the Hydro Empowerment Network. You can get that on this link which is shown here. That was developed by uh, GSZ together with Practical Action and HPNet support. Uh, we have the mini hydropower library under Energypedia. I also provided a few links for that where you find many interesting case studies, reports from projects where you can learn a lot. Uh, and I would like to highlight also the uh, methodological approach of practical action in Nepal. They developed the so-called participatory market system development approach. You can also have a look at it under that link and there is the so-called produce page of uh, which was developed by a number of uh, stakeholders like ESMAP, GIZ and others. So feel free to look at further information on these different uh, knowledge products and as I mentioned at the beginning uh, also our webinar and the presentations will be made available and whatever questions you raise during our presentations uh, we will go through them and answer all of them in written it might take a few days until we get all the answers together but uh, sooner or later you will get them on the Energypedia webpage uh, so at that point I would like to hand over to my uh, colleague Ranisha to close down uh, the webinar and I would like to thank you very much again uh, for listening and I apologize again really for this bad uh, um, quality of the line but uh, we try to improve that and um, thanks again for listening. Thank you Heidi and thank you to all the presenters and also our listeners. As a closing remark, I would once again like to shout out to all the sponsors who are listening to, listening to us. Please feel free to reach out to either me, Dipti or Heidi if you want to support any of our webinars and you can find our email addresses on the screen and as, a, as, we, as I said before we will be launch, we will try to launch our next series in early autumn so stay tuned for that. For all the webinar materials, we will shortly send you an email that can be tomorrow or day after tomorrow where you'll, have, you'll find a link to the webinar recording from today and all the presentations and like Heidi mentioned, 
the questions will be uploaded uh, maybe in a few days as it will take some time to get all the questions answered. Now I'd like to conclude the webinar and when I conclude the webinar a, a pop-up window will appear. Uh, it's a feedback survey so please take your valuable time to uh, field the survey. It will really help us in designing the next series. And Heidi, could you go to next slide please? Uh, okay, thank you, Heidi. Um, and now a final thank you to all our presenters, all the people who helped us put the webinar series together, um, friends and members of the Hydro Empowerment Net, and everybody. And thank you so much. And uh, stay tuned for our next webinar in early autumn. Till then, thank you. Bye bye.